Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University in Shanghai where the Sihai Weishue Collaborative Learning Project is based. I want to thank you for coming to our 19th lecture and our 29th event of the Sihai Weishue Collaborative Learning Project. Today we are hosting Professor Nipei Ming's lecture titled Four Dimensions Within Mencius's Theory of Human Nature. We have a really great group of scholars from various backgrounds here to participate in this roundtable. They include Rene Camus from Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Franklin Perkins from University of Hawaii, Li Jifen from Renmin University, and our chair, Agne Vestadi from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. That was my best, Agne, I don't know. <laughs> um, this lecture will be 90 minutes and will end promptly at 10.30 a.m. Beijing time. First, Professor Nipei Ming will give his lecture, and then we will have a short discussion with each of the commentators one by one. Agne will keep the time, but she's also going to engage and participate wherever she sees fit. Hopefully at the end of the discussion, we will have some time um, for questions and comments from the audience. So at that time, you can type them, you can turn on your mic and uh, camera. We were sort of versatile with how we take questions and comments from the audience. Before thing, getting things started and handing them over to Agne, I want to say a few things about the Sihai Weishue Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sihai Weishue Collaborative Learning Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism or self-promotion. We hope to curb all types of aggressive or look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar attitudes that we sometimes find in academic exchanges. The Sihai Weishue Collaborative Learning Project seeks to accomplish these shifts in orientation during academic exchange by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We hope to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. So before introducing our chair, I want to once again thank professors Rina Camus, uh, Franklin Perkins, and Li Jifen for their time. A special thanks goes, of course, to Professor Nipei Ming for preparing a lecture for us. Um, Professor Ni also holds, although I'm sure he doesn't know it, a very special place among the fellows at Sihai Weishue and the colleagues at ECNU, especially in the English language graduate program. So I think probably a lot of scholars um, feel that their work is underappreciated, and I'm sure many students of great scholars have the same feeling. At Sihai Weishue and at ECNU, we don't have any of Professor Ni's students, at least as far as I know. Um, and Professor Ni has never expressed this sentiment, at least not to anyone I know. But I myself and many of the fellows and the colleagues around me have this feeling. And I think there's two major reasons that Professor Ni is underappreciated. The first is his translation of the Analects, which is our standard English uh, language text at ECNU, but I think has not received much scholarly recognition. Um, at least in, in my view and some of the colleagues. Um, and the second reason, which I think in some ways is more important, is Professor Ni's concept of Gong Fu, which is, in my view and many of the colleagues, nothing short of incredible. Um, a few years ago, we restructured the graduate program at ECNU, and we found Professor Ni's uh, concept of Gong Fu as really foundational for the way we thought about teaching Chinese philosophy. And as proof of this, Robert Carlio, who I think is in the audience, actually even wrote a whole article about how we did this. Um, so, and also Professor Ni's concept of Gong Fu was very influential. And I think if anyone knows it, they can see this um, in the very idea of Sihai Weishue. So I want to extend a special thanks to you, Professor Ni, on behalf of the fellows 
and colleagues at Sihai Weishia and at ECNU. Um, so uh, again, once again, our chair today is Agne. Uh, she sent me a very, very short bio, which just reads, Agne is a PhD student at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Her research focus is early Taoism and comparative philosophy. Um, but I would like to add that I know some of her teachers, and I actually had her in an online course last year. So um, I agree with her teachers that she's a very promising up and coming scholar. So we're very, very happy to have her included in our discussions as well. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for giving this opportunity to chair Professor Nistock. It's really an honor. I'll just jump to the introduction now. Um, so Professor Nee has um, just retired from the Grand Valley State University in Michigan, United States, where he was teaching for more than 30 years as a professor in philosophy and East Asian studies. Um, professor Nee's uh, main area is Chinese and comparative philosophy, and especially Confucianism. Um, so he has authored many books and articles, um, but especially prominent, as Professor uh, D'Ambrosio just mentioned, um, the book called Understanding the Annex of Confucius, a new translation of Lun Yu with annotations, which also brought him an award from the Modern Languages Association, known as um, the Scallion Book Prize. And his signature work as well, um, that just had been mentioned, uh, is called Rutia Kung Fu Tracy Lun, uh, which is Confucian philosophy of Kung Fu. Um, this is a book that systematically presents both his Kung Fu interpretation of Confucianism and his exploration in philosophy of Kung Fu. And Professor Ni nee is also currently working on the English version of the book. Um, so there's a lot uh, we can look forward to now. Um, uh, during um, his career, Professor Ni nee, uh, also was a visiting professor on many in many top institutions, such as University of Hawaii, the University of Hong Kong, uh, Beijing Normal University, he also served as um, an executive vice director uh, of the Institute of Advanced Humanistic Studies at Peking University. Um, he's also a founder and former president of the Association of Chinese Philosophers in America, and also former president of the Society of Asian and Comparative Philosophy. Um, so please, um, let's welcome Professor Ni. Nee. Thank you, thank you, Abby. And thank you, Paul, for your Following well, um, introduction of me, um, and particularly, I uh, appreciate that my work has been taken seriously by you and your colleagues and your students. Uh, that's quite an honor. And, uh, thanks also to um, other uh, colleagues who uh, willingly uh, spend the time to participate in this panel uh, for, uh, for discussion. I really look forward to getting your uh, feedback. Um, now, uh, let me try to share my screen. Uh, I have a PowerPoint. Let's see, share screen, okay. Oh, I need to open the PowerPoint first. Right, show. Sorry, I'm not really very familiar with everything here. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see the uh, PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. So the uh, title of my uh, lecture is uh, Four Dimensions Within Confucian, uh, Within Manchus Theory of Human Nature. Now, um, Manchus theory of human nature is like Chinese philosophy 101. Uh, whenever you teach Chinese philosophy, um, you always will hear people talking about Manchus theory of human nature. The basic ideas are pretty simple. 
uh, sounds at least simple that uh, usually people say Manchus believe that human nature is good. And in contrast to his contemporary Daozi, who believe that human nature is neutral. And uh, uh, a later Confucian who argue against Manchus, uh, who maintained human nature is evil. And so this is an interesting uh, controversy debate within Confucianism that has been talked about uh, repeatedly by many, many scholars. It's like a well-beaten path. Uh, but then why uh, bring this up again and talk about it? And I hope I can bring something new to the uh, topic. Uh, but here, let me first summarize the basic logic of Manchus' theory of human nature. Uh, according to Manchus, human nature consists in what is distinctively human. And humans are born with four incipient tendencies, Situan or uh, sometimes we refer to as four hearts, uh, but animals don't. The four hearts are the hearts of compassion, which is the root of run human heartedness, the heart of shame, the root of the uh, appropriateness, the heart of modesty and uh, courtesy, which is the root of lee ritual propriety, and finally the, the heart of right and wrong which is the root of zi, wisdom. And since humans are born with these four hearts, but animals don't, therefore these four hearts constitute human nature. And naturally, since these four hearts are good, therefore human nature is good. And now furthermore, uh, Mencius argues that one's nature is imparted by heaven. And one should live according to one's nature. Therefore, people should nurture these four hearts and live accordingly. And this is um, <clears throat> a typical reading of this theory is that it's a met metaphysical account of uh, uh, human nature, which provides the basis for Confucian value. And uh, it is also the basis of the unity between heaven and human, right? yeah, which is also a central theme within Confucianism. Now, the significance of this topic is twofold. One is historical. Um, it, it's central within the Confucian tradition. And hence, therefore, since Confucianism is the mainstream uh, of uh, Chinese culture, it's also... Uh, holds a central place within the entire Chinese culture. Uh, Confucianism in Chinese is called the way of Confucius and Manchus. And within Manchus theory, uh, his theory of human nature is like a foundation uh, for his methods of cultivation and even for his polit social political philosophy. And we know that he, he differentiates a, a the, the great part of the human person and the small part of human person. The great part of the human person is the heart mind, which consists of these four hearts. It's important to cultivate the, this great part of the person and retain the heart of the newborn baby. Uh, when, when we're born, we're all born with these four hearts. So we should retain these four hearts and um, uh, uh, going after the straight heart, if we, we uh, lost these four hearts, we should go after and find them back. Uh, and even his social political philosophy is based on that. It's uh, 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 known as meritocracy, that uh, a good ruler is the one who cultivates one's four hearts and the rule according to these four hearts. And this theory, together with uh, the Confucius grandson, Zi Si, his, whose theory is uh, where Manchus draw his inspiration from, um, they served as the major source from which Song Ming Neo-Confucianism unfolds. And in the 20th century, uh, a manifesto for a 
reappraisal of sonology and reconstruction of Chinese culture by new Confucians, contemporary new Confucians, Tang Junyi, Mo Zhongshan, Xu Fu Guan, and Zhang Junmei, uh, claimed that the doctrine of Xing Xing forms the nucleus of Chinese thought and is the source of all theories of conformity of heaven and man in virtue. It is the Dao Tong lineage of the way from ancient sage kings to the present uh, that holds the Chinese culture spirit together. So it, it has a very important uh, place within the history of Chinese culture. And it has, at least as believed to, have great importance in um, modern human life as well. Uh, the aforementioned four new, new Confucian scholars authored the manifesto, uh, argue that it is an, uh, uh, it is the, the anchor of the spiritual life of the Chinese people. Uh, it is great, it is the most important valuable contribution that China can make to the world. And Professor Du Weibing, who is a leading scholar in contemporary Confucian, uh, the revival of Confucianism, argued that the Zhu Manchu's theory of the heart mind and the human nature, sorry, uh, are the central content of Confucian spiritual humanism. And it's the bedrock for constructing a global ethics today. Um, Professor Chen Lai, who is also a leading scholar in Confucianism in mainland China, argued that the theory of uh, Renbenti, or ontology of human heartedness, um, is, um, is an ultimate reality, an absolute metaphysical substance, a fundamental principle of the universe. Anyway, he he also draws from Manchu theory and argue that uh, uh, it has great modern relevance. So now the theory actually is more complicated. Manchu theory of human nature is actually more complicated than it appears. And it is subject to controversy as well. Um, as I should argue in this presentation, that it has four dimensions. Uh, it has a metaphysical or ontological dimension. It also has a semantical dimension. It has a value recognition dimension. And finally, a Kung Fu recommendation dimension. I should lay out these uh, in this talk. Um, without clarification of these dimensions, the theory may sound outdated, unconvincing, and even confused. So let's begin with some uh, uh, explanation of uh, parent problems that this theory has. First, uh, here, this is the uh, aforementioned argument the outline of Manchu's argument. It begins with the premise that human nature consists in what is distinctively human. Now, we know that this is not the only way to define human nature. Uh, his contemporary in Gaozi differs from Manchu's uh, in arguing that whatever we are born with, um, that's human, human nature. So in Gauzi's understanding, all our natural tendencies are parts of our human nature. <clears throat> and uh, Xunzi, he argues that what cannot be learned and cannot be acquired by effort is human nature. So they both disagree with Manchus not only in conclusions about whether human nature is good or not good, but 
but uh, with Mencius, they disagree about what human nature means. Okay, so here, uh, let me move to the next slide. This table may uh, show more clearly uh, what's going on here. From different definitions of human nature. Then, together with empirical facts, they draw the conclusion that human nature is good or not good or neutral. Yeah. So, um, basically, from this table, we can see that Mencius is saying, what differentiates humans from animals is human nature. And since humans have the full incipient tendencies, whereas animals don't, therefore human nature is good. Xunzi here is saying what cannot be learned and cannot be acquired by effort is human nature. And our natural desires, which are the source of evil, are not learned and cannot be acquired by effort. Therefore, human nature is evil. And the Gaozi, according to his understanding of human nature, whatever we are born with a human nature, given that we are born, what we are born with, we can either do good or evil. Therefore, human nature is neutral. So now it appears that their debates, disagreements are fundamentally rooted in their different understandings of what human nature means. So here we are pushed from the metaphysical or ontological level dimension to the dimension of semantics. Indeed, looking at uh, what Xunzi talked about human nature, mm. if he adopts Mencius' definition of human nature, uh, he could ag agree with Mencius that uh, uh, and these passages from Xunzi can seamlessly inserted into the book of Mencius. Um, Xunzi says, Water and fire have vital energy, but no life. Plants and trees have life, but no consciousness. Birds and beasts have consciousness, but no sense of appropriateness and rightness. Humans have vital energy, life, consciousness, and in addition, a sense of appropriateness and rightness. This is why humans are the most valuable beings under heaven. He also says, what makes human human is not that they are featherless bipeds. It is rather that they draw boundaries. They make distinctions. Animals have fathers and sons, but there is no difference, uh, no affection between father and sons. They have male and females, but they make no separation between man and woman. And Mencius, on the other hand, uh, also can agree with uh, Xunzi that the difference between humans and animals, and animals is very slight. Uh, it only consists of these Fu hearts, which, which is in Mencius' own term, Ji Xi, very, very slight. The common people lose this distinguishing feature while the exemplary person obtains it. So now, does it mean that uh, the whole debate between Mencius, Gaozi, and Xunzi are verbal? Well, it's again, not so simple. Uh, let's continue to examine the theory. The second premise of Mencius' argument here, outlined here, is that humans are all born with the four hearts but animals don't. Does this adequately mark the human-animal distinction? Let's first look at it. Do we all have these four hearts? Well, according to uh, Harvard psychologist, Martha Stout, uh, about 4% of the human race are sociopaths. Sociopaths are those who cannot feel compassion. 
uh, they may imitate people around them. When they see somebody suffering, they may also say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's because they see other people doing this and they, they understand this is an acceptable social uh, response. Uh, but the in, inside of their heart, they don't feel the compassion. So if this is true, then um, Manchus claim that we all born with the four hearts would be problematic, right? We know that in, induction can never be uh, universal. Um, but then uh, Manchus' response to this challenge is that those without the four hearts are not human. But now this defense or response turns the proposition that all men, all human beings have four hearts from an empirical generalization into a stipulative definition. So according to this, then he can never be falsified. And if he can never be falsified, wouldn't that make the claim that all human beings have full hearts uh, become meaningless, right? And furthermore, do animals have no four hearts? Um, there's no lack of signs of sympathy uh, and love among animals, especially advanced forms of animals, right? Sometimes animals also do altruistic behaviors, right? uh, whether it's between their kin or across species even. <clears throat> okay. So the second prim premise is problematic. And furthermore, the third, um, well, here the conclusion from the previous two uh, premises, which also serves as a third premise for further arguments. Manchus, based upon the first two premises, Manchus argues that therefore the four hearts are what constitute human nature. Right. But then we know that there are other ways uh, even if we agree with Spencius that uh, uh, human nature consists in what is distinctly human, there are other ways to differentiate humans from animals. Uh, one common way of differentiating humans from animals is that humans are capable of thinking and reasoning, whereas animals only act according to their instincts. Another um, way of differentiating humans from animals is that humans have free will. Uh, we are autonomy. We, we are autonomous beings, whereas animals are heteronomous. They are driven by their nature. <clears throat> Furthermore, humans are capable of using language. Humans can uh, do creative work, uh, even you can argue that humans different, if, are different from animals, that we have a sense of humor. We are the only species who can use drugs to alter our state of consciousness. And it's hard to uh, say which one is the right one, right? So um, this is also problematic. And furthermore, the next premise, one's nature is imparted by heaven and one should live according to one's heavenly given nature. Now, should we live according to our heavenly given nature? Um, following uh, American philosopher Harry Putnam's uh, Twin Earth thought experiment, we may think in such a uh, hypothetical scenario, scenario. Suppose there is a twin Earth, uh, the Earth has a twin brother, that in every aspect, they look just like our planet Earth, except that animals on that twin Earth are all with the four hearts. Whereas the humans on the twin earth are contrary, they don't have the full hearts, okay? And 
because the humans on that twin earth, they learn from the animals and constrain their behaviors. And therefore they, got, they, they are able to survive. Okay. Here we see a case in which it's better for the humans on the twin earth not to follow their uh, heavenly given nature. It's to the contrary, it's better for them to, like Confucius saying, on seeing the worthy, think of how to equal them. Actually, nowadays, we also um, uh, try to imitate animals in many ways that like uh, uh, eating more natural food, uh, living in a more natural environment, fighting against some of the side effects that modernity brings. <clears throat> uh, in evolution, many species survived exactly because they don't, they went through a, a mutation. If they follow their given nature, they would have extinguished. So here the whole point seems to be entail, uh, seem to entail a confusion between what is the case and what ought to be the case. Uh, our heavenly given nature is what is the case. It doesn't necessarily follow that we ought to follow our given nature. Now, Professor Huang Yong, uh, he, who is a good friend of mine, and uh, we, we often have arguments uh, uh, on, on theoretical issues. And this is one thing that we, we had disagreement and still not settled uh, disagreement. He articulates um, the Manchus argument in a powerful way. He says, we cannot evaluate whether something is good or bad unless we know what we are talking about. So he, for instance, used the example of um, uh, a cactus. The to evaluate the quality of cactus, we must first understand what a cactus is. To evaluate the quality of a wolf, we must first understand what a wolf is. For the same reason, to evaluate the goodness of a human being, we need to know what a human being is. In other words, he says, we need to have an objective conception of human nature and does not matter whether we our conception of human nature is teleological one, a functionalist one, a naturalist, a scientific one, or an essentialist one. Um, an acorn because of its gift of nature will grow into an oak tree. An acorn that cannot grow into an oak tree is thus a bad or defective acorn. Similarly, an infant baby, because of its gifts of nature, which in Manchus' case are the full hearts or full sprouts, will grow into a full blown per human being with the four cardinal virtues. Now, Wang Yong is certainly right in saying that there must be some objective basis for any assertion about human nature. However, what this argument needs to take into account is an important distinction, a distinction between having a view about the nature of X and the objective nature of X. In order to say that a good acorn is one that under certain conditions will grow into an oak tree, we must choose to identify its nature as an acorn. If we identify its nature as food for squirrels, then the goodness of the acorn will not be judged by whether it can grow into an oak tree, but according to whether it can become part of a squirrel. Right? So similarly, we can have a variety of ideas about human nature. If we regard people as rational animals, like Aristotle does, then human goodness will depend on their intellectual power. 
if we regard people as being capable of creative act activities, then human goodness will depend on one's creativity. Right? Um, if we identify a human being as um, a free will who can choose, then certainly we we judge the best of a human according to uh, how autonomous the person is. Therefore, rather than saying that the quality of people depends solely on the objective nature of human beings, it is better to say that our conception of self-identity includes our choice of value. It must include our choice of value. In other words, the metaphysical concept of what we are is inseparable uh, from what we want to see ourselves as. Um, here I can uh, mention that uh, Wittgenstein's observation of the famous uh, duck rabbit picture, uh, which is well known to us. Uh, Wittgenstein says, says that I see a duck and I take the image in front of me as a duck is one and the same process. For the same reason, what the human being is may be considered what we take a human being to be. It's one and the same. This is not to deny that there is a fact that is relevant to here, but stress, stressing the relevance of the other often neglects. Um, here I'm uh, stressing the other often neglected side of the picture. <clears throat> Now, then why does Manchus choose to define human nature in this way if there's, there are so many problems in his argument? Do I mean that Manchus theory is wrong? Well, I think Manchus theory is heavily reliant on the other two dimensions. Beside the ontological dimension, the semantic dimension is the value recognition dimension and the Kung Fu recommendation dimension. <clears throat> uh, why does Manchus choose to define human nature in his way? It is because he realized that full hearts are good for humans. Manchus believes that good means desirable. Of course, what is desirable is subject to cultivation as well. Right. Through cultivation, we can understand better and better what is truly desirable for human beings. And humans uh, may vary from one to another about what is truly desirable. And this also allows what I call uh, the competing visions of excellence. According to measures, Ren and Yi are truly desirable. And he uses the fish and the bear's palm analogy to show that we value run and e more than we value life. At least a truly cultivated person uh, should realize that. <clears throat> and he also argues that run and e can make life flourish. Uh, he says, being morally right, one can face a thousand men army without fear. And this, this run and yi is what makes flood like chi fill between heaven and earth. And he mentions that once the inclination toward good is cultivated and fills the body in the form of chi, uh, vital energy, it can manifest itself in one's face, giving it a sleek appearance. It also shows in one's back and extends to one's limbs rendering their message intelligible without words. You can, you can look at a person and see the, uh, the vital energy inside. <clears throat> and it can also make one feel that all the 10,000 things are there in me. So from this value recognition, and Manchus define human nature according to 
the four hearts. So here I, I bring up a, a point that I probably will be uh, uh, very controversial, but uh, I'll see how you would re respond to that. I think the Manchus theory is better called san xing ren than xing san ren. Better summarized as what is good should be recognized as human nature rather than human nature is good. It is more accurately an affirmation of value conveyed through metaphysical language than a metaphysical justification of value. So here the idea, what is a human, is actually bring up an ideal to strive toward. And finally, the, the Kung Fu recommendation dimension. Another reason for Manchus to choose to define human nature in his way is that it consists of uh, recommendation. There is a very thought-provoking passage in the book of Manchus. Let me read it. Okay, um, I highlighted the words nature and fate here. These are key words here. It is due to our nature that our mouth desires sweet taste, that our eyes desire beautiful colors, that our ears desire pleasant sounds, etc. But there is also fate, whether these desires are satisfied or not. The exemplary person does not say they are man's nature and insist on satisfying them. On the other hand, the virtue of human heartiness in the relationship between father and son, the virtue of righteousness in the relationship between ruler and minister, etc., these are endowed in people in various degrees according to faith. But there is also man's nature. The exemplary person doesn't refrain from practicing them and say they are matters of faith. Here I included a picture of the famous example of um, a glass of water is half full or half empty. Okay, Manchus is basically saying that here is, is a fact. Okay, human humans are born with the four hearts as well as all these desires. Okay, we can either call these desires nature uh, or call them fate. Uh, or we can call the four hearts, fate, and, uh, or nature. Actually, it's a choice. How do we choose? Well, Manchus didn't specify. He only says the exemplary person, Junzi, will not say that these desires are our nature. And they will not say that the four hearts are fate. Why? Well, Zhu Xi has a very clear explanation. He says these two kinds of tendencies are both in our nature and are given to us by heaven. Yet ordinary people take the first five, that mouse desires, sweet taste, etc., uh, as human nature. And when they, when they don't have the desired objects, they insist on having them. They claim that since that's our nature, then we, we are entitled to satisfy them. Right? They take the latter five, the virtue of, which is the virtue of humanity in the relationship between father and son, etc. They take these as fate. So once they don't have them, they give up. This is why Manchus speaks on what needs to be emphasized with regard to each in order to advocate one and discourage the other. Okay, in, in our previous example of, uh, of glass water, it's like encouraging people to identify this as half full rather than half empty. Um, here, it's Manchus advocate the full hearts by calling them as our human nature in order to encourage people and say, these are since these are our nature and given by us, uh, given to us by heaven, so we have an obligation to fulfill them, develop them. Okay. And 
A uh, similar realization is found in contemporary new, new Confucian scholars also. Fang Junyi uh, uh, once said, initially I followed the Song and Ming Conf Confucian's teachings, uh, thinking that only because human heart mind is good, is it possible for everyone to become Yao and Sun, the sage kings. <clears throat> However, recently I suddenly came to the realization that the intent behind Manchu's teaching about human nature to be good is to teach people to follow the goodness that they originally have, to make up, to come up with a resolution themselves and to uphold the eternal idea, ideal. Hence, I become aware of the spirit of the entire teaching of Manchu's. It contains a way of stimulating everyone's resolution to rise up from the low and to establish themselves. This way, to put it simply, can be named the way of establishing people. Uh, beside Tang Junyi, Chen Mu also explains that when Mencius claims that human nature to be good, his true intention was to inspire people uplifting confidence and in encouraging their uplifting effort. So now, uh, given these, this is when we come back and look at Manchus and Gao Zi Xun's debate, um, we see that uh, different light Mencius, his theory versus God's. Mencius uh, mentioned a couple of times that his, his view, God's view, will lead people to believe that run and e are injuries to humans. And, in, and this view, when used to guide our personal cultivation, will result in losing touch with the internal source of morality. So, there is a, a, a large part of Manchus' motivation to argue against the cults is that it will lead to a different gong xiao, gong fu effect. And Manchus' theory versus Xunzi, once looked at from the kung fu perspective, we find that they are two different kung fu approaches. Uh, Wang Yaming has remarked that Manchus speaks about human nature from the original source, wanting people to make effort on the um, source to become right and pure, to, to become bright and pure. Junzi speaks about human nature from the consequential flaws, putting efforts on correcting the wrongs at the end of the downstream. Manchus' view is good for encouraging people to expand their innate goodness, and is therefore an approach um, commonly practiced in child education today. So we see that in child education, uh, we often hear teachers say to their students, oh, you are all good kids. What a wonderful kid you are. Okay. These, well, may be true descriptions, but often actually it's more like a, a encouragement. You should, the teacher is telling the children, you should identify yourself as a good kid and therefore you will become good. And we see Xunzi's view uh, often applied in um, like um, correction facilities and addition, addiction workshops. You know, usually these places, they want you to first recognize your problems. What is your problem? I have a problem and now I can identify it and then I can correct myself. Okay. And these two views as two different Kung Fu approaches, um, they have social political implications also. Manchus view will offer a support for uh, meritocracy Whereas Xunzi's view is less optimistic about human nature 
entails a destruct of the innate goodness of people. This will lead to more uh, attention to what he called jing zi, uh, use the social infrastructure. <clears throat> and now, where does Confucius stand? Here, uh, it's interesting to bring uh, back Confucius' view. In the entire analects of Confucius, there are only two mentions of the word xing, uh, nature or human nature. Uh, one is the remark that by nature, humans are similar. Confucius didn't say that similar in what way, good or bad or neutral. He only says the humans are similar through habitual conduct. They diverge widely. So the emphasis, Confucius lays the emphasis clearly on the habitual conduct, the practice. Um, there's an, uh, another occurrence of the word xing in the analects is Zikun's uh, mark that the master's manifestation of culture is something that may be heard. His discourse is about nature of human beings or things. The way of heaven, however, are things that cannot be heard. Uh, so we can guess probably Confucius deliberately uh, stayed away from conjecturing whether human nature is this or that. He, he lays the emphasis on uh, Kung Fu practice, on cultivation, on self-transformation. Uh, if you put emphasis on transformation, you can become good regardless of your uh, original nature. Whereas Manchus and Xunzi use two different views about human nature to uh, as Kung Fu recommendations for also becoming better persons. Now come back to the uh, most common interpretation of measure theory, which follows the logic of metaphysics. Basically, it's saying that since heaven imparts the full hearts in us as what is distinctively human, uh, we have a moral obligation to live according to the full hearts. What is the logic of Kung Fu is, since it's better to live according to the full hearts, we should take the full hearts as what constitutes human nature and as the mandate of heaven. Um, it's interesting to, com to compare and contrast the two logics. The logic of metaphysics say, why define human nature according to human animal distinction? Well, that is a problem for the logic of metaphysics, as we previously talked about. The logic of Kung Fu will respond by saying, by identify human nature with the four hearts, humans can do better. The logic of metaphysics has the problem that is it true that humans are all born with the four hearts and animals don't How about sociopaths? Well, the logic of Kung Fu will say, well, instead of busy judging others whether they are humans, we ask ourselves, if I am a human, how should I treat others? I should treat others with human heartedness, with appropriateness. The logical metaphysics has the problem of human animal distinction that can be made in different ways, such as reason, free will, language, etc. But the logic of Kung Fu will say, well, th these different ways of conceiving human animal distinction may lead to different approaches of life. And we can evaluate the goodness and respective merits and disadvantages of these different approaches of life. Right? And finally, uh, the logic of metaphysics has the problem of you know, confusing ought and is, since as Hume famously argued that no ought can be derived from is, um, from what is the case, you cannot de you know, deduce what ought to be the case. Um, and it was subject to the twin earth thought experiment uh, counter argument. The logical Kung Fu would say that if we are on the twin earth, Manchus would say, let's learn 
from the animals. I think he would alter his theory. Yeah. So in summary, um, Manchin's theory of human nature is typically taken as a descriptive proposition that human nature is good. However, it contains multiple dimensions. Beside the ontological dimension, which is about whether we are by our nature good or not, there is a semantic dimension. What do we mean by human nature? And in addition, there is a value recognition dimension. It is based on that. And together with the fourth dimension, Kung Fu instruction dimension, uh, that mentions choose to define human nature as what's distinctively human. Okay. Um, uh, the value recognition, recognition dimension asks us what does it mean to be a good human? And mentions answer is that it is with run and e, uh, human hardness and appropriateness that is what uh, constitutes a good human. And what would it, uh, the, the Kung Fu instruction dimension ask is what would be the, uh, uh, the belief do to us? Manchin's answer is that if you believe human nature is good, constitute these four hearts, it will do better to you. It will make you a better person. So, it is consideration of the latter two dimensions that determines Manchu's choice of handling the first two. The human animal distinction, which is a major pillar of Manchu's theory of human nature, is first and foremost Manchu's action of self identification about what it means to be a human, and not just a generalization of empirical observation. This act of self identification is furthermore a Kung Fu recommendation. It is a way of establishing people. The theory appears to be a description, but it is more a choice, a commitment, and a recommendation. And uh, uh, this interpretation will treat conflicting metaphysical beliefs as mutual uh, well, conflicting metaphysical beliefs, they are mutually exclusive. They cannot all be true, but competing visions of excellence uh, and Kung Fu reference, they can be complementary, just like what we mentioned, that the Xunzi and Manchu theory can be complementary. Okay. So the, finally, let me wrap up with uh, the signif significance of the uh, analysis the Kung Fu dimension is central to the Confucian tradition uh, because Confucianism, the central con concern of Confucianism is cultivation of the person and trans transformation of uh, people and society. <clears throat> and there, therefore it is also central to the entire Chinese culture. The Kung Fu perspective is also what Chinese culture can contribute to the world. Uh, here, I want to bring up a, a, a concept of anticipating a Kung Fu turn. You know, it's well known that Richard Body brought up the term, the linguistic turn, uh, when uh, the middle of the last seventies uh, of the last last century, uh, philosophy of language was prominent. And Richard Wadi edited the book, The Linguistic Turn. And interestingly, in that in book, the introduction of that book, he says, the only moral that can be drawn from the linguistic turn is that the metaphysical, metaphilosophical struggle of the future will center on the issue of reform versus description. A philosophy as proposal versus philosophy as discovery. Now he, from the linguistic turn, he already foresees a turn toward Kung Fu of cultivating 
human beings and transformation of the world. So the doctrine of Xing Xing, uh, that uh, the new Confucians, um, Tang Jun Yi, Mo Zhong San, et cetera, uh, they brought up as the central part of Chinese culture. It may look outdated in the postmodern age if you uh, take it as just a metaphysical account of reality. But from the Kung Fu perspective, it is very much needed in this age as an ontological commitment and Kung Fu recommendation for human life. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you. And may your Kung Fu increase. Oh, um, thank you, Professor Lee. Um, it was really fascinating talk. Um, and I want to start with the inviting uh, our commentators to, to comment and ask questions. So the first commentator is Dr. Rina Kamus, who is working at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, she was teaching philosophy courses several years ago, and now she continues to work um, in PolyU. Uh, service learning and leadership office um, uh, office um, where she does educational research and supports the teaching and the development of service learning subjects which enable undergraduates to apply academic learning to community needs but on the side uh, dr kamus um, has continued to be active in the chinese philosophy field uh, and research um, she's interested in literary metaphors and published a monograph entitled um, archery metaphor and ritual and early confucian texts uh, and now she's also um, co-editing the Tao Companion of Confucian Applied Ethics. So Dr. Camus, yeah, please take over. Thank you so much, Agnes. Well, thank you so much, um, the Professor Ni Ping. Uh, the last time I saw you was uh, in an ISCP uh, uh, virtual meeting because it was during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice to to be able to listen to you again. Um, and I quite agree with you that um, the, the human nature um, debate continues to be very interesting. Um, I did my PhD in in Taiwan in Zhengzhi Dashi, and it, it Taiwan is one place where Chinese scholars uh, continue to give a lot of importance to the human nature debate. Um, and there's a very rich discussion about uh, different ways of understanding nature. Um, nature could be understood as what we are born with, as, as you pointed out with Gaozi. Um, uh, maybe Shunzi had a similar uh, understanding of nature, maybe what is given to us by heaven, or what makes one thing different from another. Um, and for Mencius, it seems that his understanding of nature is if you understand, if you isolate the term Xing, seems that he's thinking of something more dynamic, you know, how a thing develops if it is allowed to grow under favorable conditions and without damaging external influence, right? And um, there has been a, a talk that maybe the fundamental difference between Mengzi and Shunzi is not so much that one thought human nature is good and the other one human nature is bad, but more the difference in understanding nature <laughs> in the sense that one thought of nature in a rather static sense, what we are born with, and the other one was thinking of nature in a more dynamic sense, like these innate tendencies that can develop into um, moral virtues, right? We could say it that way. So I, I, I wanted to invite uh, Professor Pei Min uh, to, to if, if you could share with us a little more about uh, how would you uh, uh, see this term Xing, isolating it from Ren, Ren Xing, just that uh, concept of nature. Um, how do you think uh, Mencius understood this term, right? Um, and another uh, thing that I wanted to raise is uh, the Gong Fu ethics that uh, Professor Pei Min um, has talked about. I find this a very attractive um, way of, of uh, interpreting Confucian uh, and Manchian philosophy. Um, it's very attractive uh, also because it's an iconic part of the greater Chinese tradition, Gongfu. Um, on the other hand, now this is uh, with 
with my bias to metaphysic to metaphorical terms. Um, Kung Fu seems to connote uh, forceful physical activity, right? Um, and so I'm wondering whether when you use the term Kung Fu, are you using it metaphorically? Are you applying it to uh, mention philosophy in a metaphorical way? Or do you really mean literally that this is a Kung Fu ethics, right? Yeah. So maybe I'll end with this. And maybe if there's time, I could uh, ask more things later. Okay, I will let me thank you. Thank you, Irina. Um, yeah, uh, I appreciate your comments. And uh, that, that allows me some opportunity to further clarify what I meant. Uh, first, your question about Xing. Uh, as in my response to Huang Yong, uh, I do agree that uh, Xing has to do with objective facts. Indeed, we, we realize that now, nowadays, the springtime, you see that everything emerges from the ground, you know, flowers. It's amazing that different uh, seeds will grow into different kinds of plants. That's determined by their xin nature. Okay, but then my point is that in addition to uh, recognize the fact, uh, we also need to realize that when we talk about xin, we always embed into our understanding of the Xin of something, our uh, choice of what it is. There's always a choice involved. When, when we think of a tree as a, you know, beautiful natural object, um, that's very different from viewing it as a, a potential firewood, right? Uh, if you understand in one way, you, you evaluate this, oh, it's a good tree. But if you uh, originally conceived as firewood, you may say, well, this is not a good firewood. Uh, so there's always a choice involved in it. And this is often neglected in our understanding of Xi. <clears throat> Second, about uh, Kung Fu ethics. Now, I forgot to mention that um, my understanding of the term Kung Fu is, uh, I define it as the art of life. Although nowadays, uh, people often associate Kung Fu with martial arts, physical activity, uh, talents particularly due to the Kung Fu movies, <laughs> Jackie Chan, <laughs> uh, Jet Li. Um, but originally the Chinese word Kung Fu meant time spent on something and then gradually ex extend its meaning into uh, the ability that entailed in the effort of doing something, the method of doing something, and the effect of doing something. So I think I think the term kung fu has four dimensions. Four dimensions. One is time and effort. The second is method and approach or style. The third is ability, talent, skill. The fourth dimension is the uh, effect ideal that you want to achieve. And so many new Confucians, when they, they use the word Kung Fu frequently, they use the word in these four meanings, um, usually without, um, without explanation, just uh, alternatively. They use these the, the same term, uh, anticipating that people can tell what they exactly mean by reading the context. But now, um, in today's ordinary Chinese language, we also see people use the word Kung Fu very broadly, not just the martial art. Okay. Uh, it, it can be martial art, but it can also be the art of like uh, playing piano, 
the art of calligraphy, the art of speech, the art of associated with other people, the art of ruling, the art of, you know, you name it. So in general, it's it means the art of life. And and I I think this this is a very much needed dimension in philosophy that due to um, the, the preoccupation of uh, knowledge about truth, knowing that in the Western tradition, uh, so the Kung Fu dimension is eclipsed. In the ancient Greece, uh, philosophy was a way of life. Okay. But the, uh, in ancient Greece, there was already a, a, a overall orientation toward the um, rational part of the, the way of life, right? But Sophia, Sophia is, is the intellectual reason, uh, intellectual wisdom. Uh, so the practical wisdom was considered less, uh, less important or inferior to the uh, intellectual wisdom. And over the years in the history, gradually Western philosophy developed a tendency of excluding the practical transformation of the person, uh, which now we need to bring it back. And I, we already see this happening see this happening, like, like the World Philosophy Conference, uh, Congress, World Congress of Philosophy um, in 2013, uh, which was held in Greece, I believe. The theme was philosophy as inquiry and as a way of life, right? And the next one, uh, 2018, held in Beijing. Were you there? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a huge conference, and the theme was uh, uh, philosophy, uh, 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 learning to be human, learning to be human, right? So it's also about transformation of the person. Now. So it's people gradually realized more and more about this dimension, although you know, people may not be using the same term that I would, I prefer to use, uh, Kung Fu. Thank you again. Um, Dr. Camus, if you want to respond quickly, please. No, I, I, I will. Uh, I would rather listen to Frank first. Yes. Okay. Yeah, maybe we'll have more time. At the end then. Yes. Um, then I'd like to introduce the second commentator, which is Professor Frank Franklin Perkins, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Hawaii and also the editor of Philosophy East and West. Um, so Professor Perkins' main interests lie in the classical Chinese philosophy, early modern European philosophy, and um, in the challenges of doing philosophy in comparative and inter intercultural context. Um, so he is um, an author of many books, um, very famously a book of um, on, titled Heaven and Earth are Not Humane, The Problem of Evil in Classical Chinese Philosophy. Um, he also published books uh, on European uh, philosophy and comparative uh, philosophy, um, so several books titled um, Leibniz, A Guide for the Perplexed, as well as Leibniz and China, A Commerce of Light. Um, he's also co-authored the book on Chinese metaphysics. So Professor Perkins' interests, of course, are very wide. Um, and perhaps most importantly for this talk today, um, his most recent uh, book um, is a, a book on Mencius, uh, which is titled Doing What You Really Want, An Introduction to the Philosophy of Mengzi. Um, and now uh, Professor Perkins is a visiting professor at the Divinity School in the University of Chicago. Um, so please, Professor Perkins, uh, the screen is yours. All right, thank you, Payman. Thank you so much for that talk. It, um, you know, I try to listen critically to think what I could challenge or disagree with, but I just, just I agree with your whole thing, <laughs> you know? So I don't, I mean, and and you put it, so I, I think I'm, I'm arguing for a similar interpretation, but you lay it out so step by step and so clearly and the way you frame it, I hope that um, a lot, I hope a lot of people will be persuaded by your position, you know, and, and uh, we'll, we'll shift the whole interpretation of Mengzi in that direction, I, I think would be great. Um, I think I'll just, we don't have a lot of time and I'll just focus on two questions. 
And these are questions because I'm, I'm interpreting Mengs, I think, in similar ways to the way that you're reading it. These are questions that I'm really trying to figure out for myself. So they're they're hard questions you know, uh, that I just would like your opinion on. So the first one is, is a pretty abstract question, which is there's something strange required about the mental attitude of, say, considering human nature to be good when you know that that's just a choice of a way to look at it. Right. So, you know, it's not really good. So you can't believe it, but you have to kind of believe it for it to have any efficacy at all. Right. So there's something very, a very strange mindset there that I think can't be belief unless, unless you're acting kind of in, in bad faith that like you convince yourself it's true, even though you kind of know it's not true. Um, I've been thinking about it in, in exactly what you raised with the, the duck rabbit example, something like aspect perception. So it's not believing that it's true, but it's viewing it in a certain way, maybe by perceiving it in a certain way. But I'm not sure that that really gets at it either. But so I'm wondering what you could say about that kind of middle ground of not just believing it, but also not just not just seeing it as a choice, right? It, it seems like it has to be more of a commitment than just a choice. And I think Mengzi, it's really interesting that that 7B24 is in the Mengzi because he's telling us that you like he's not describing things accurately. And so it, it's just odd that he puts that in there, you know, because it's like telling, telling us the, the whole thing that he's been kind of misleading us the whole way. Um, and then he's telling us that, you know, this is kind of a choice. So anyway, that that mindset and that connects into the second kind of maybe complex of questions. But and this is something I know you would agree with that the Gong Fu approach has to be highly contextual. Right. So in terms of my own thinking about trying to be a good person, I think Mengzi's ideas are useful in lots of contexts. But even in that context, there's ways in which I could imagine thinking I don't have to make so much effort because my nature is good. Or thinking, I'm not, I'm not even human because these things Mengs is describing, I don't feel them. And then feeling like it's hopeless to become virtuous. And so it seems like even on the level of just self-cultivation, it's the right way to look at it in some contexts, but maybe not the right way to look at it in other contexts. And if you step more broadly, it might not be the best way to look at political situations to think, well, everybody's good. They're all human beings. There, it might be better to be more Shunzian sometimes, you know? And so that ties into the first question because I wonder how much you can switch back and forth between these. You know, Mengzi seems like you need to be a committed Mengzian and always do it this way. And Shunzi thinks you have to always do it this way, but would it be possible for us to look at it in a Menchian way sometimes and look at it as Shunzian way in other times? Is that a, like a, even feasible as a kind of mental strategy? So that's all, I know those are really hard questions. They're really the two things I'm trying to figure out about Mengzi right now. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Well, thank, thank you. Right. Um, first, I, I'm very glad that you, you agree with my views. Um, and you, your two questions touched uh, two spots that are really intricate. Um, the first one, um, indeed, all Kung Fu beliefs. Um, in, in Kung Fu, there is a, uh, a kind of tricky uh, feature. Um, that as you characterized, you have to believe in something that you know that it's not uh, totally true. Um, let me bring a term that I I created on the basis of a passage in the Analects. I call it as if is. Remember the saying that uh, Confucius says, uh, pray to the spirits as if the spirits were present. Um, I think this is a very interesting and unique position uh, with regard to spirituality. It's not a, certainly not a theism. It's only talks about pray as if the spirits were present. 
It's not asserting that the spirits, they are present. It's not atheism either. It's not even skepticism. It is its own kind. It is a method of cultivating your spirituality, your, uh, adjusting your subjective attitude. And in, in my talk I just gave, I, I used the term ontological or metaphysical commitment. Um, this is the kind of as, as if you take this to be good and you try to put yourself into such a commitment, believing this subjective attitude will have a good Kung Fu effect. Now, of course, this can be this kind of method can be misused. And I call this an advanced Kung Fu. Okay, for most people, it's more straightforward, easier to simply say, hey, human nature is good. You just believe it. <laughs> okay. But then for, for those who like to think, who like to, you know, dive deeper into the issue, they find, oh, gee, no, there are so many problems. Right. So Mencius 7B24 seems to be prepared <laughs> for that kind of people. Uh, would like to ask further, further. He's revealing what he's truly doing. What I'm truly doing is to say that, you know, exemplary people shouldn't, um, Junzi should choose to identify themselves in that way. Uh, I think Zheng Guofan, uh, in his diary, I don't have the quote right here with me. I, I can find out later. Um, fine, it's in my computer. Um, he mentioned a few things that example person will talk about and a few things that example person will not talk about, even though it's true. Well, also, you can see that in daily life uh, examples, in a wedding ceremony, you, you never say, hey, nothing lasts forever. <laughs> Right, you say, "Oh, hope your marriage lasts forever." That kind of good wish. <laughs> okay. Um. Now, the second question about the contextual feature of kung fu. Indeed, given the realization that Mencius is making a kung fu recommendation here, it helps us to see it more contextually. That, uh, I mentioned that it particularly works well for child education. Um, but with uh, drug addicts, alcoholics, um, it may need to be combined with supplemented by Xunzi's theory also, that you have a problem to fix. And here, they, these two methods, don't, they don't need to be uh, contradictory, they can be complementary to each other. Right. Um, yeah, indeed, I I also agree with you. That is, it has to be contextualized. It does also have the tendency of leading people to believe, oh, I have a good nature and so on. I don't need to do much. Yeah, indeed. All right, thank you again. <laughs> If I could just add one, I know I just one comment is that I, I, it's making me wonder how relevant Zhuangzi might actually be in this context, because that seems a lot about this ability to entertain a perspective. Yeah. Um, I'm partly thinking about this because I'm teaching Zhuangzi and peace of mind right now tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But this ability to have a perspective, but change it in context. Indeed. It seems similar to Zhuangzi in certain ways, too. It's interesting. Yeah, thank you very much for this exchange. Um, we do not have much time, but uh, maybe for more or two, uh, one or two questions. Um, and I'd like to use this opportunity to ask a question myself. Um, so I was wondering what Professor Ni would you think, because you were mentioning this aspect of some people as psychopathic, but having psychopathic uh, personality types. 
And do you think that mentors would think that they were born without Sidwan or that they lost it later on in life? Uh, can you repeat your question again? I was just wondering um, whether you would think that um, the Sidwan, this kind of human nature that um, is uh, more like inborn in mentors and everyone is born with that. And some people, as you mentioned, like say, psychopathic people, let's say, um, lose that later in life, or maybe they were never born with that. So I'm just interested in in what you think, Gerdan. Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> um, this is more like an empirical question. I I don't know. I I have personally, I haven't never encountered a sociopath. But then, uh, according to the scholar Mash Mather Stout, who uh, authored the book the social past next door. Um, she says that 4% of us are social path. But she also says that uh, you may not be able to um, tell the difference because the outward behavior, they will look very normal. They will imitate the rest of us um, in, in outward behavior. So, but I think it is possible that some people may be born with lack of this kind of abilities of sympathy, empathy. Uh, what's more relevant to the Confucians would be how do we treat them? Do we say, therefore, you are not human, so we can treat you cruelly? Or do we say, well, since I am human, I believe that a human ought to have compassion. Therefore, I ought to treat you in a compassionate way, right? Um, yeah, this then comes back to the contextualization question that uh, Frank has. Um, I, I mentioned in my talk that if Mencius were born, and all of us were born in a twin earth, uh, whereas humans are all cruel. And Mencius would say, let's let's learn from animals. So if we we do find people, even if ourselves lack that kind of uh, ability to love and care, um, we, sh we should learn from the worthy. We should try to change ourselves if possible. Thank you, Professor. Um, and there is one question in the audience, and I think we still have time uh, for that. So I see uh, Lu Yong Li um, is raising a hand. So please just unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Professor Ni, for a wonderful lecture. I just have a quick question, uh, uh, quick question about the relation between the Xing Shan Lun and Shan Xing Ren. You bring up the uh, Shan Xing Ren, and I, I'm wondering about the relation between the two. Do you uh, would you like to use the Xing Shan Lun as a complementary theory to Xing Shan Lun, or uh, or you think that the uh, Shan Xing Lun could uh, be used instead of the uh Xing Shan Lun uh, in our discussion. And also I'm wondering about the uh, whether there is a, a danger or uh, uh, assumption to say that uh, when we are talking about Shan Xing Lun, um, uh, there are some part of the Xing is not Shan. We only Shan the part, uh, some part of the Xing. Or uh, maybe uh, our Xing is not uh, so good at the very beginning, so we make it to be better. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, good question. Yeah, well, uh, I've never thought about whether these two are complementary. What I meant was um, that Manchester's theory appears to be Xing San, appears to be saying that human nature is good, uh, but as passage 7b24 shows that what he is actually proposing is san xing, but we should treat the good part of us as human nature. And in that way, we can become better and better. 
Um, so in that sense, now, in order for us to um, hold the San Xing Ren, we need to believe in Xing San Ren. As if Xing San Ren is true. As if. Again, as if is. You know what I mean? We, we need to have the commitment, ontological commitment, to believe that to be a human, you must be good. And you, you, you must take these four hearts as human nature. So in that sense, they are complementary. Okay, so they they complement each other in uh, this as ifism, as ifism. As for whether only parts of us are good, um, Manchester theory seems to be saying that these four hearts they are good, um, but then we can easily be led astray by our other desires. Well, we notice that uh, later Confucians, such as Wang Fuzi, uh, talk about even transforming our other desires into what's distinctively human. Uh, animals eat, we humans eat also, right? That's a very natural desire. But humans eat in a, in a human way civilized way. Animals have sex, humans have sex also, right? But humans have sex in a civilized way. Now, so so they, they may not be totally separate. They, the four hearts may saturate into our desires and that, that's part of what we need to do to cultivate ourselves so that we can be elevated Entirely, not just these four hearts develop and then leave the other desires out, transform the whole entire person. Uh, thank you, Professor Ni. Uh, can I follow up a little bit about that? Uh, could we say that uh, Mencius gives a new definition of what is Xing? Uh, he, uh, like by defining that only the good part is the xing uh, and something bad is not our human nature. Uh, in this way, we could say that uh, uh, that is uh, what we call the shan xing lun. Well, whether it's new or not, that's a, a, a subject that historians of thoughts uh, can probably address it better. I'm not an expert in this regard, but I would like to point out it's pretty common um, because you see in, in, in the West also, Aristotle um, defined human nature according to what's distinctive human. And he thinks that uh, intelligence, right? The, the, the ability to think is what's distinctively human, make human better than animals. That's the good part as human nature. Right. So, um, yeah, this, this is not just a unique to, to Manchus, but Manchus um, made it uh, uh, an important part of his theory. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Ni. Nee. I think uh, the time uh, ran out, so we have to finish. But it was really inspiring for me as well. And um, yeah, thank you for bringing my philosophy as a way of life. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it was it was a great session. And I also would like to thank um, Dr. Camus and Professor Perkins for facilitating such a great discussion. So thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Agnes. Thank, thank, thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Dr. Doctor, thank you, Professor Amy. And, and Frank, it's really nice to see you. <laughs> Yeah, it's good to nice see to you. see you all. Nice <laughs> thank, you. thank you also to the audience. Yeah. And thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> Paul, yes. We should all thank our host. Yes. No, no, no. I'm looking no. forward to the next session. <laughs> okay, it's next week. So. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah.
And then the week okay. after, we have one. Uh, we have three this month. So. Okay. Right? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.